Hi, um, my name is Laura McLean Brown, and I'm hosting this Emerging Writers Festival Lunchtime Lit event on writing relationships. And I'm here with Victoria Hannan and Ashlyn Smith. Um, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge the First Nations and traditional owners of the land we're broadcasting from, the Wurundjeri and Bunmurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to the elders past and present and to the, elder, and to the elders of the land this recording might reach. So as I said, I'm here with Victoria Hannan and Ashlyn Smith. So I'll start by introducing them both to you all. Um, start with Victoria. So Victoria is a writer and photographer living in Melbourne. Kokomo, her first novel, was the winner of the 2019 Victorian Premier's Literary Award for an unpublished manuscript. So hi, Victoria. Thanks for being here. Hi. And um, Ashlyn, will, uh, Ashlyn Smith is a writer, editor and academic. She was the winner of the 2020 Rochelle Prize for Emerging Writers and won third place for the St Kilda Historical Society Short Story Competition. She completed a PhD in Literary Studies at the National University in 2019, researching the fiction of David Foster Wallace through the lens of affect theory. She currently works at Collarts as a curriculum writer. And I'm Lauren C. Brown. I'm a writer and social worker living in Melbourne, and I had my first book published last year, Cherry Beach, through text publishing. So, um, hi guys, nice to be here with you. <laughs> yes, um, likewise. Yeah. So today we'll be talking about writing relationships. So we've got some questions. Um, we'll have a bit of a chat together, just what we have thought of, you know, what we'd like to discuss, and then there will be some time at the end for audience questions if you have any. Um, so if you've got a question you'd like us to ask or me to ask the others, then just use the chat function on YouTube. Okay, so um, I thought we'd start with a question sort of around ethics. So ethics in relationship writing, um, yeah, can be complex, obviously. So um, I just wanted to hear a bit about from each of you on what kinds of responsibilities you might have as writers writing ethics in their writing relationships. Um, and I guess does this differ for us as fiction writers as opposed to other kinds of writing, um, such as creative fiction and then things like that. So, Tori, did you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I think about this all the time and I don't actually know if I have a good answer for it because I think it changes with every different thing that you write and I don't think it's actually possible to write anything without writing about relationships, whether that's between people or the relationship of how we interact with the world or even the relationships that we have with ourselves. Um, and because without relationships, what would there be to say? Um, but I think with fiction, we can hide behind the lie that what we're saying is completely made up um, and then, you know, treat every book as if we're an episode of Law and Order SVU and have that little thing that comes up at the beginning that says this is all based on on not, not real people and not real stories. Um, I think when you're writing uh, non-fiction, when you're writing memoir, there are definitely some muddy areas and definitely some questions about ethics there, which is I think partly why I try not to write too much of it because one of my great fears in life is having people be mad at me. Um, so if I can stick to fiction, at least I can pretend that it's all made up and then no one will, no one will be angry. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, Ashley, did you? Um, yeah, so I would agree with that. I would, yeah, I'd say that fiction writers aren't as beholden to the facts as, you know, uh, creative nonfiction or other forms of writing like memoir. Um, but I, I don't see fiction as like carte blanche to just write whatever. Um, so yeah, like Victoria said, I think that ethics is still an important component, even when you're writing fiction. I guess I feel like writing can be a form of betrayal, even if it exposes secrets or violates intimacy. Like you know, there's a line where something should be kept private, like they're personal or sacred even. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of, so A.S. Byatt wrote a book called The Children's Book in which he talks about family relationships um, and particularly the parent-child relationship and the idea 
like the difficulty that being a writer, um, the toll that that can take on families. Um, and this idea that there's this person in the family unit that has these power, this power to expose like these really deeply personal stories. Um, and that can make for really great writing, but at the same time, like how destructive is that going to be on the people around the writer if those like personal stories are kind of just appropriated for artistic purposes? Um, and by its contention was that there's like inevitably a violation of trust that happens anytime you take material from your own life and write about it, even in a fictional context. Um, and I, I wrote my honors thesis on that book and it was around about the same time that I was getting more serious about my own creative process. Um, and yeah, like Victoria, this is something that I think about all the time. Um, like I don't have kids, but in friendships, in family relationships and romantic relationships, like I feel like these F, these questions of ethics and responsibilities are just things that we're we're constantly confronted with as writers, like trying to determine what is that line. Um, and I think it's it's subjective, like it's all something a call that we have to every writer has to make for themselves. But I feel like it's yeah, it, it's a really tricky, really tricky question. I have a friend who is a writer, and he thinks that everything is up for grabs. Like, even if you're stealing stories from a friend who is a writer, just whatever happens, if you get to it first, then it's yours. And I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but it's an interesting way to work. Um, yeah. It's, what it's do you so, think, Laura? Yeah, well, it's so personal, isn't it? And I think it's, even as we're talking, I'm reflecting on how important it is to, to really think about it because I think for me I've had a tendency to sort of think, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to take all of that so seriously because my writing doesn't mean that much and it's not that important. But, you know, if you have a book that gets published, if you have things that are published on the internet or in journals, I guess that, that is important. It's serious and it's, it, it is safe. You know, though, if you're writing about relationships and things do come through that are personal, that is potentially sacred stuff that you're putting out there. So it's really good to reflect on it and think about how, who do I want to be as a person and a writer? Like maybe, yeah, maybe I'll have to think about that a bit more. Yeah. And it's interesting, Ashley, that you bring up A.S. Wyatt because I know her um, sister is my favourite writer, um, Margaret Drabble. Margaret Drabble, yeah. And they're famous. I mean, I'm not going to say much because I don't know much, but that, there's a little bit of um, perhaps a fraught relationship there. Um, yeah. And the way Margaret Double writes about women and female relationships is I love it, but she's very good at um, writing about, I guess, tense and, you know, women who are very different being in relationship with each other. And, yeah, I wonder if that comes from her experience. It's interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, and I wonder as well, like for me, I, I'm also, as I was thinking of these questions, is it possible to to write, um, you know, fiction without, or relationships in fiction without your own relationships seeping through, you know, even if you don't think they are? Um, I wonder if anything comes up for either of you when you think about that. Um, I don't think it is possible. I think even if we think we're starting with a blank page, we're never actually coming to something with a blank page because we're bringing all of our experiences in the world. Um, so I think, yeah, that's the lens that we just start to see things through whether we like it or not. And we can push ourselves to think about things in different ways, but we're still always going to be seeing things through that, through that lens of our own experience. Um, all of the relationships in Kokomo were definitely coloured by uh, relationships that I had with real people, some more than others, and some were thinly veiled. Um, the relationship that Mina has with her colleague, Jack, was based uh, really on a real person and real experiences that I had in the workplace. And 
I don't even try to hide any of that um, because I thought it was quite a powerful thing to talk about. And also it was really cathartic to get some of that stuff onto the page and to work through it. So I think, yeah, you can try and pretend that it's not going to seep through, but it's always going to in some ways. And other people might not be able to see it. Um, the reader won't necessarily know, but you'll always know. Yeah, that's um, that's really interesting, Victoria. I, I think you're probably right. Um, I'm definitely still living in denial on that one. So <laughs> if people talk to me about my novel, I'll be like, no, no it has absolutely nothing to do with me, um, which yeah, may or may not be true. Um, but I find it's interesting because I think that like as a reader, I absolutely read things through the lens of like autobiography and kind of um, I'll often conflate art, art and artists, like assume that if I am reading about something, the person kind of has um, lived experience with that that issue. But when it comes to me as a writer, like I, I really, I kind of really prickle um, when people like assume that I'm writing about something that, that happened to me. Um, so maybe it's yeah, sort of just... I feel like it won't always necessarily be like an exact an exact reflection of what happened, even if it's just like a feeling that you felt about a person in a particular time. Like you can't pretend that that didn't happen and not include that in things. I don't think anyway. Maybe I just need to get a better imagination. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm similar, Ashley. I do prickle a bit when people sort of think or say, you know, so. So this is based on you, right? Or that you've had, yeah. yeah. And I think that's partly because I sort of think what you don't think I can make yes. up something and for it to be believable. Um, but I, I kind of think that, yeah, that's so true that it could just be like a, a part or some, the way you felt about a relationship on a certain day or just, because I, like, I often think like when you're starting to write a character, they sometimes seem to come out of nowhere and they just, for me anyway, it's like it just happens and it was meant to happen that way and they just become this thing or they're already there and it's all a bit magical. But it's sort of a bit like a dream, I guess, like dreams, mm -hmm. how we're making sense of things that have happened to us while, as we're writing and creating, but we don't really realise and it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't make sense in the way that it's clear. It's kind of like a dream. It's a bit murky and you don't really know why it happened exactly like that, but it's all these little ingredients from your life and your days that have been mixed in together. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah I, I think, yeah, I think that's true. I wonder the extent to which, even if it's not something that directly happened, as you say, it's like a new hope or a dream or a projection or a fear or a doubt or something that has like, um, an element of you, like there, there is, you are at stake in your writing, even if it's not like a direct. Yeah, um, or even like how, how you wished somebody behaved in a moment rather than how they did behave. You can kind yeah. of put your hopes and dreams into, into other people, into imaginary people mm. and mould them in ways that you wish real people could behave or the opposite even. Yeah. Just explore a worst case scenario of somebody um, on the page that you didn't get to do in real life. Yeah, and that cathartic element, like as in with dreams, how you're, you know, you're consolidating things that have happened as they think dreams might be a bit about that and how sometimes, you know, a person is one person but they kind of have a little bit of someone else in them in the dream or they're slightly nicer or meaner or like it's... Yeah, yes, yeah, like where you know it's Julia Roberts but it's not actually Julia yeah. Roberts, that kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like she looks nothing like Julia Roberts, but it is Julia Roberts. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I guess the other side of that that, we've, um, that we were thinking of talking about is regarding um, writing beyond your own experience. So something quite different from what we've been talking about, you know, is it okay to write about um, particular kinds of relationships that you might not have experienced yourself? Um and, you know, if you do do this, how do you do it ethically or authentically? Again, that's a really tough mm. question and one that I don't think there is a definitive answer for. I think always when you write something, you should be asking yourself if you're the right person to be telling that story. And I'm really glad to see that own voices is something that we talk about a lot 
in the kind of writing community at the moment because it's so important. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm a cishet white woman and I don't want all of the stories that I tell to just be full of white people. I want them and I want them to kind of reflect the diversity that I have in my life and the diversity that I see in the world. And so I think there is a fine balance in understanding your place to tell those stories, but also reflecting the kind of diverse nature of your reality. Mm. So yeah, I don't yeah. know the answer to that question. Yeah, I think you said it perfectly, that line between diversity and inclusiveness in one's own writing, whilst you know, not claiming subject positions that aren't your own is so hard to negotiate. Um, and yeah, particularly when it comes to marginalised groups, um, that's, that is fraught. Um, yeah, and even though I think to some extent you can go and do research, you can talk to people, um, you can create some awareness in yourself um, around relationships or characters, um, but I would, um, yeah, like f for me in my writing, um, friendships between men is something that I basically never write about um, just because I don't feel like I have any insight or anything to offer into that space. Um, and even if I went, out, went and spoke to my male friends about it, like I wouldn't, I feel like ultimately that would read like an intellectual exercise um, rather than something that's actually, you know, authentic. I think also it's really important to ask yourself why you think you want to tell that story. Like what's driving um, your motivations to want to tell a, a story that's different to yours um, and kind of explore what those motivations are and that might help you answer the question of where, whether or not you should be doing it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and um, I think for me, um, what comes up a little bit is the protagonist of my novel, Cherry Beach, is gay, so she's a lesbian, but um, I guess I don't identify as gay, but I do identify as bisexual, and I have had relationships with women in the past, and um, close people in my life. I mean, and you know, I, as I'm talking about it, it's like I'm justifying, you know, why I wrote this story, um, but yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I have very close people in my life who are gay, lesbian, um, and I wanted, I, yeah, I guess I just wanted, a, I wanted to be able to read a, more stories where the um, protagonist was was queer, was a queer woman, um, and yeah, but, but I still wonder if that um, and yeah, we're considering about that from people, I guess. Um, yeah, but let's move on. So, um, so did anyone else have anything on that before I? Uh, yeah, I guess I was just going to say that, like, obviously, we definitely need more stories from different types of people. So I think it's very much up to people like me to think, am I the person that should be telling this story? And if I um, think that I, well, are there people who could be doing it better? And am I taking the place of someone who should be telling this story instead of me? And the answer to that, I feel like it's almost always yes. Um, so I think part of the uh, our responsibility with as writers is to make sure that we are um, lifting other people up and moving out of the way for people who would do um, justice to those stories better than we would. Yeah. Once the door's been opened for us, I guess our responsibility is to open it up for others um, and not Absolutely. just keep it open for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, writing different kinds of relationships. Can you speak to, um, I guess, because it, yeah, different kinds of relationships are very different to write and um, I just wondered, did you have kind of different experiences when you've written about different types of relationships, like familiar relationships, romantic friendships, um, and how do you sort of avoid the tropes or the cliches within those different types of relationships? You don't have to answer all of that. <laughs> yeah. um, so in 
Kokomo specifically, I had a lot of different type of types of relationships. The main ones were um, between the protagonist Mina and her best friend Kira, uh, and between Mina and her mother Elaine. Uh, and I feel like the experience of writing both of those relationships was completely different. So with the best friend Kira, it was kind of a joyful experience. So these are um, two women who grew up across the road from each other and have been essentially like sisters their whole lives. And their relationship felt very true to me and felt like messy, but also and kind of tinged with jealousy in certain ways, but then just such a positive, strong bond between the two of them. And they know each other so well that even though they haven't spent that much time together in the last seven years, when they're reunited, it feels like they haven't been apart. And that was just that's such a joy to write a really positive female friendship. Um, and I tried to litter those throughout the novel because they're one of my, one of the joys of my life is my female friendships. Um, and so to be able to inject some of that almost as like a tribute to my friends into the novel was really important to me. Um, when it came to write the experience of Mina's relationship with her mother, it felt very different because there was so much tension between them. And when Mina came back, it was almost like these, it were these two strangers living in a house together. And so I needed to show a lot of that tension kind of in their body language and in the way that they felt around each other rather than in the dialogue because they were being essentially like pretty polite to each other. But underneath that, there was a lot of tension. And it was really a lesson in learning how to kind of harness some of that body language and uh, those feelings and like show those feelings rather than telling those feelings in dialogue. Um, and I guess one of the other important relationships in Kokomo was the romantic ones because they actually weren't that positive for a lot of people. So Amina had a couple of kind of interesting sexual encounters in this book and they were sort of fun but also challenging to write. And there was one of them in particular where in my head I was just like trying to make it as gross and as uncomfortable as possible, which felt very gross and uncomfortable for me to write. But then the, the entire time I was writing it, I was like, if this book is ever published, my mum is going to read this and how is she going to feel about that? And that made the whole experience worse because I was just worried about what she was going to say to me once she read it. And actually, she didn't say anything after she read it. Um, so that was a relief. But I did see there was like a little look of disappointment in her eye when I saw her after she read it. But um, yeah, it was like finding the balance between all of those things was really tricky. And so I did kind of draw on real experiences but also kind of amalgamated a lot of um, those experiences to kind of build some relationships. So yeah, to, it kind of incorporates some relationships that I had with different people into one person. So there were certain people that were amalgamations of a few people in my life. And there were uh, some experiences that I wrote about that were based on real life experiences and that helped. But then I did amplify some of the gross, uncomfortable parts of it. Yeah, that's really interesting, Victoria. I haven't had that experience of um, such sort of clear demarcations between how writing particular relationships has felt. Um, I haven't, yeah, the sort of, I've written about friendships, family relationships and romantic relationships. Um, and yeah, yeah, not that, not that sense of enormous differences between them. Um, I think I like writing about romantic relationships best. Um, that's naturally where my mind tends to go. Um, I think that that question of cliche, Laura, that you um, that you mentioned um, when you asked the question definitely comes into play here. Um, how to capture particularly relationships that are stable and functional and happy um, in ways that aren't like trite and saccharine, I think is a challenge. Um, I, I think it's easier sometimes to write kind of very um, hopelessly dysfunctional relationships and they kind of feel more literary. Um, so part of the challenge for me in my writing has been trying to, okay, let's just tell like a really happy relationship and try to yeah write it in a way that doesn't uh, resort to cliche. Um, and for me, I think the answer to that's been in the, the writing styles. So using language um, in a way that you know, hopefully is sort of um, has a kind of elegance to it um, and sort of undercuts some of the um, 
I think of some things like if you're using very flowery prose for a very sweet relationship, then it has the um, danger of becoming sickly. So, yeah, for me, I think language use um, is, is, yeah, the answer. Um, it also, yeah, it also strikes me as interesting um, on that, that note of like sex scenes, Victoria, things like the bad, the bad sex award. Um, and just yeah. like, but just like one, how of my, one of my favorite things to read is some of those terrible, oh, yeah. like that, that Murakami one from a few years ago was just excruciating. I think it really speaks to just how difficult it is to capture these really intimate um, moments of human experience and connection though in words, like ultimately relationships are non-verbal um, and, you know, it's about a feelings, it's emotions. And I think that the whole project of trying to put it into language and words is just so inherently like difficult and, and even flawed. Mm. And, and relationships in real life are people are yeah, flawed and people can sort of say and do sort of problematic and not so nice things to each other but love is complicated and it's hard to um to put that into a relationship on the page in a way where the character is likable despite their flaws and you do care about them even though they're complicated and maybe not that likable or you don't maybe understand or have their perspective it's it's challenging and yeah and I don't know if, if there's a formula but I think it, it kind of just maybe comes out of of imagining that person or, or having had relationships in your life and having a complicated um, yeah I think I, I, in Cherry Beach, there's a couple of, I, there's an intimate relationship and um, I, it was interesting to write for, for Ness, my protagonist, she's not had a lot of experiences, not really at all had experiences with intimate relationships and sexual relationships and it was interesting to be writing because I, I don't know about you guys, but for me when I first was intimate with other people, I was so in my own head and it was my body and my head and I, I wanted this other person but um you know it's like all you can do is start to move out and experience something more than yourself and that was really interesting to write because um yeah it's kind of like it's quite freeing to write that because you're sort of um, blossoming or something but um yeah I just realized how much like when you're starting off becoming intimate with someone else it's really all about you so it, it's kind of it is easy to write that because it's, the character is so in their own head I don't know if I've yet worked out how to not be in my own head so maybe we'll have to talk after this <laughs> <I think. laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I have <laughs> yeah nice to write characters you have though <laughs> yes we can hopefully yeah. learn from them maybe yeah. aspirational yes yeah. yeah um so where are we up to so um yeah regarding so i guess we've talked touched on this a little bit but dialogue um tell me about writing dialogue i'm just interested to hear like do you enjoy writing dialogue do you find it challenging how do you do it um yeah i feel like this might be a little too revealing about myself but i think i've been having kind of imaginary conversations in my head my entire life and so <laughs> when it comes to often i'll be like catastrophizing a conversation like a difficult conversation that i have to have with someone but um yeah i feel like that actually really comes in handy when it comes to writing dialogue for fiction because often I'll start a scene by having the conversation between the two characters in my head and then I'll kind of write down what works and then build from there. Um, but yeah, I think I touched on this before, but like one of the, the biggest things that I've learned is trying to say a lot without the dialogue. And so just, I feel like you could be having a conversation with someone, but the way that they move their body or the way that they feel within their body or the way that their eyes flick or something that their face do says almost a hundred times more than the words that come out of their mouth. 
and even like they can be saying one thing but they can be really be meaning another so it's finding that balance has been um a really interesting challenge for me um but i think also for most of my career in advertising i've done a lot of like where i've had to write voiceover and i've had to write silly tv scripts and radio scripts and so i have kind of been working on this sort of art of snappy dialogue for a long time and obviously they play different roles but just kind of thinking in that conversational tone has um, been something that I've been doing for a really long time so I definitely think that helps. Yeah I um, I 100% agree Victoria the kind of non-verbal verbal aspects of communication really interests me as well. Um, I definitely do the um, self-conversation as well. Um, my boyfriend has said to me that I've never met anyone that talks to themselves as much as, as you seem to. So <laughs> it must be a, maybe it's a writer thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think that dialogue, there's a kind of natural um, musicality, I guess, that speech has, you know, the rhythm, the cadences of, of natural conversation that for me, I've always found really difficult to replicate persuasively in dialogue. Um, it always feels like quite artificial. So wherever I can, I tend to um, tend to avoid it and rely more on on description than um, yeah than dialogue. I, I think it's a gift. Like people that can write plays um, and present you know these deeply complex, nuanced relationships um, just through an exchange of dialogue. Like that is amazing. Um, I'm in awe of that. But it's it's not me. I'm not, I'm not. Um, one thing that I also try and remember is like often you'll be talking to someone and the thing that they say will really surprise you and it won't be what you think that they're going to say. And so I always try to inject some of that into my dialogue with characters. It's like there's the thing that I would say next, but I'm not this character. And so what is a thing that would be surprising to me if they were going to come out with that? That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think my problem is I often think, what would I say when yeah. I'm writing dialogue? But well, none of the characters are meant to be me. Um, but yeah, no, that's really that, great. it's like a dream. They're all you. They're all Julia Roberts. They're all you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's an interesting thing. Yeah, I'm. I find it very challenging to write dialogue. Um, I don't enjoy it. I'd much prefer to write like just a whole novel that is actually read a no novel recently where there was no, no dialogue and god that would be the dream for me um maybe i can do it one day uh and my editor has even said like it's not your strong point Laura. <laughs> um yeah that wasn't yeah that wasn't hot it wasn't great yeah but it was okay um have you changed the way since getting that feedback have you changed the way you approach writing dialogue not, I just, not really, like I'm still kind of, I do try, I don't know about you guys, but I do try to like, I say it out loud or I, I imagine how someone would say it and, um, you know, I try to sort of imagine that character saying it, but I don't know, I, yeah, I think what you were saying before, Ashling, about like, I often find dialogue the musicality of dialogue versus the musicality of how I'm writing it just doesn't seem, they don't fit together. And so I feel like that's a good read to view. Someone wrote a very deep recently where they said, you know, the dialogue is completely unrealistic, but maybe that's the point. And I was like, yep, that's the point. That's, <laughs> the point. that's, the, that's what I'm going to deliberately unrealistic. <laughs> You know, I feel like that's a great thing to say to any criticism you get from now yeah, on. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, no, I meant that. That's the yeah, point. That's, that's, uh, yeah, just make them feel slightly stupid for saying it. <laughs> um, but you know, I think the way I write is a little bit odd or a little bit not real worldy or something. So then the, the diet, like, realistic. Yeah, not something I particularly enjoy, and I'll have to keep thinking about. But I really love that point um, about things so obvious now, but just yeah, to think about what that person would say. And often people, I mean, almost always people say things to me that are Yeah. 
people say stupid surprising things all the time yeah yeah, yeah that's a really good tip i'll be using that one too uh, yeah um yeah and this i don't know if this is like really on topic with relationships but i'm always really interested in how people come up with their character names and um is it again something you enjoy do you find it difficult um do you i just have heard people say that they you know they'll think of a name because it it's literally the name of someone that reminds them of this character or you know like do you guys have thoughts on those things um, I'm pretty lazy, so often I will just name the character after the person that they're based upon and then we'll just not bother to change it later because I can't think of anything better. So the Kira character in Kokomo is partially based on my friend Kira. Like I just didn't even bother. It just felt right. And I didn't, I didn't actually tell her until I sent her a copy of the book and then she was just elated to know that there was a tribute to her in there. But I feel like a lot of the other characters, they just sort of came to me in the moment and I just stuck with them because, again, I they just I lived with them for so long that it, I just couldn't think of anything that suited them more. Um, if I'm struggling to think of a name or if something doesn't feel quite right, I will often go to, like, uh, just Google what the 20 most popular baby names were, like the approximate year that the character was born and then pick something from there. But if I'm feeling like I want to put a little bit more effort into it, I might kind of look at a characteristic of a per of the person's character and see if I can find a name that means something similar to that. So in Kokomo, um, Mina's ex-boyfriend Ben has a new girlfriend and her name, um, the meaning of her name is the chosen one. Um, so that was, everybody else is just kind of based on real people, but that was that one I put a little bit of effort into. Yeah, I'm quite similar to that. Not not so much base. Um, well, not so much using uh, the names of real people, but it's not something that I've ever really kind of um, like agonized over. I'll just I'll be writing a character and a name will just come to me and I almost always end up using it like my mind. They sort of walk up to me in my head and introduce themselves like that's the name. That's what I go with. Um, on occasion, I've used a character name and then met someone in real life who shares the name and in those instances um i've gone back and changed the character name if it's felt um sometimes it's felt a bit strange to me to have kind of um yeah a character in fiction um and someone in my life sharing a name um but yeah by and large it's it's been a naming's been a fairly easy process um yeah yeah I, my, my new novel that i'm writing is as the section is in Poland, and I've been to Poland a couple of times, but only for little holidays, and have a few people I know who are Polish, so I've been asking them for, like, like, I mean, you can Google it, but it's but it's much more helpful with, it's been helpful to ask my Polish friends, like, so what's your mum's name and what are your auntie's name and what was a name that Polish women had who were born in the 50s or, and I've just, you know, learnt things like in Poland, people have their formal name and then they have the name that everyone calls them and it's the same name. So, it was, um, yeah, like it could be, It's this is not what it is, but it could be like um, Lauren is the formal name and then Laura is the name that everyone calls you. And, yeah, it's just really interesting to hear about things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm the same. Like, names just come to me um interestingly though i seem to name a lot of men in stories who i don't like sean and i eat <laughs> and it's which spelling of sean s-e-a-n i don't know why i don't even know anyone called sean and um yeah, that's the, that's the bad sean no, i'm just kidding yeah. <laughs> yeah and yeah and then i just realized the other day there's a character in my new book called sean and i was just <laughs> Right. really strange going on here. I feel like um, you should do a little Easter egg where in every book you write in the future there should be someone called a bad man named Sean. Maybe, yeah, maybe I must embrace it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very weird. Um, That's really funny. Yeah, I just, yeah, very, yeah, probably should talk to my therapist about that. But anyway. <laughs> 
Yeah, so we, when we were talking about what we wanted to talk about today, for a little bit more time before we go to questions, um, we talked a little bit about, um, I guess, relationship as a writer and um, the relationship with, between us as writers and our writing community. So I just wondered whether um, you had some regarding yeah, the writing community that like you're a part of or part of. I feel that or pitfalls to, yeah. I feel like post publication, the having a community around has been invaluable. Like or even just before publication as well. It just felt like I was having so many feelings and it was so nice to have people to go, this is the way that I'm feeling. Is this like, is this the way you felt? And everyone is always going to write back and go, oh yeah, that's completely normal. Like you're going to want to vomit. You're going to have nightmares. You're going to wake up sweating. Like all of these things are going to happen. You're going to feel different levels of shame like throughout as from before the public, your book is published all the way through probably until the day you die. <laughs> um, it's all normal. Um, so I feel like that's been incredible. And then even just through the writing process of my next book, having a group of people who can just like buoy you when you're feeling down and tell you, you know, that you can, you can do it. It's that simple. Or seeing other people kind of in the different stages of their writing process as well. Um, going through the ups and downs, it's all unbelievably helpful. And I think one of the things that I realized after kind of as I had the book coming out I always thought that kind of the Australian lit scene was like impenetrable and very intimidating but actually most people are so lovely and welcoming and just want you to do well um, and so my advice for anybody out there who wants to kind of talk to people and get in touch and kind of form a writers group is just like reach out to somebody and say hello um, tell them that you like something that they wrote and ask them a question and I think people will always be really open to to talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've had similar experiences with the um, writing community and I think that because writing is such a sort of solitary occupation, I think we do have to find those like social uh, interpersonal uh, relationships where we can. Um, there's lots of like groups on Facebook that I found um, helpful. So binder groups, groups for young Australian writers, different kinds of writer. Um, there's, you know, I think people are really good about circulating opportunities. Um, and yeah, by and large, I haven't, I haven't found people to be like too competitive either. I feel like most of the time, if you have a win, people want to cheer you on and celebrate that. And they're kind of like, you know, able to be happy for you and vice versa. So yeah, pri privately, like seething with jealousy, <laughs> publicly, very, very kind. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea that we're kind of there to sort of lift each other up and, um, you know, all get to the finish line together. Um, I think just books in general, like absolutely writing as a community, but literature as well, like, you know, book clubs, even the fact that we're here together chatting at the Emerging Writers Festival, um, you know, if I'm small talking with someone and I run out of things to say, my question will be, so, you know, what are you reading? What have you read lately that's interesting? So I feel like, yeah, just, just literature, writing books, it's just this, like, really connecting kind of um, connecting thing, I guess. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with all of that. And I've been really blown away by the support of the Australian writing community and, um, you know, having a novel come out, but also just stories come out or little pieces of nonfiction come out and, you know, people actually read it and they, they cheer you on and they, you know, encourage you. It's quite amazing. And, um, it, yeah, and they, could, they could be seething with jealousy, but also, you know, it's like balancing both support each other and see the jealousy and like that's cool too and um yeah i've loved being able to be honest with people about how it's all felt and um it's incredibly important as you say it's such the slowest very thing and um i have found places like twitter to be really wonderful like obviously twitter is kind of challenging but it's kind of me um but it's i've met a lot of 
fun to play with riding the table thing or riding can be really just really cute with us. So, um, yeah. I was wondered as well, with, well, we've only got, got about 15 minutes left. We've got one question at the moment. Um, I'll go to that in a second. Um, I just wanted to ask either of you whether you, whether you sort of have any um, relationships in the fiction that you've read or that you're reading that come to mind when you think about um, writing relationships, whether your favourite relationships or interesting um, I really love uh, Commonwealth by Anne Patchett. I think that she does such an incredible job writing about sibling relationships in that book. Um, so as a blended family, I think there's five or six of them, um, of, the, of these kids, and they kind of meet each other when they're very young and we follow them throughout their lives into adulthood. And just the way that their relationships kind of ebb and flow, I feel like it's quite realistic and you don't often see kind of just people growing or like the relationships growing as the people do. Um, and I think she's just a, a master at that. And I also really love um, kind of unusual relationships or kind of, I don't know, slightly creepy or, or strange ones. So books like The Pisces where the protagonist is in a relationship with a merman. Um, it shouldn't work, but it does. I don't know how she does it. It's um, Melissa Broder, it's incredible. And I think Miranda July is very good at that as well, kind of putting two people together who you wouldn't normally expect to have a relationship and then just like watching it all unfold. Um, so yeah, they're definitely some of my favorites. I think um, for me, for, well, for sisterly, um, relationships, Jane Austen, um, Pride and Prejudice, like classic. I just, I love that depiction of sisterhood. Um, and even though it's sort of not the, this is one aspect of the novel, like, you know, there's heaps more going on, but just the way she kind of um, represents what are quite complex dynamics in a way that's just, you know, beautiful and readable and lovely. Um, I think Jacqueline Moriarty does a wonderful job of relationships as well, um, particularly friendships. Um, you know, often like a lot of what she writes is within the young adult fiction uh, genre, but I think that that genre is so wonderful for um, for friendships. I don't know that, for me at any rate, I don't know that um, adult fiction always does it as well as um, yeah, uh, young adult stuff, which I guess makes sense because it's um, geared towards a readership which is mostly concerned with with things like friendships, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what comes to mind for me is, um, again, as you, those more unusual relations, well, not unusual, but not typical. Um, I recently read uh, a novel called Will and Testament by Vigis Kujok, who's a Norwegian writer, and then I just got so obsessed with the way she wrote that I, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you finish a book and you're like, I just have to read more of her writing. I mean, so I just have um, read another of her books called um, A House in Norway. And oh, that this is the book I was talking about that doesn't have any dialogue in it. And it's most one of the most amazing books I've ever read. And really the main relationships in the book are between the protagonist and her house. So she has a house that she owns in Norway and it's just, um, it really explores what it means to own a house and how, you know, the upkeep of a house and um, the identity that she has a lodger who is from Poland and she doesn't really, um, she doesn't identify with the lodger at all. She doesn't really care about the lodger and she starts to actively hate the lodger um, throughout the book and towards the very end looks at herself and thinks, what on earth is going on here? Like, why, I, you know, this is, a, this is a human being who, you know, um, has a life and um, it's just, it was just really interesting because it was a very honest kind of depiction of the way we can have a relationship with another human being but 
do not give them really any empathy or compassion at all and not even think about it and not even necessarily be, you know, a terrible person, just that, that this is what can happen and it's really dangerous. Um, and, you know, class ownership is essentially why this happens all the time. And then the third relationship in that book is um, her relationship with her creative network with her creative and she's a female artist and she makes these really, really big tapestries and she's quite and she gets, sells them and gets um, has to sort of asked to do different projects and it's she's very dedicated to her staff. She's obsessive about it. She it's you know, her identity is very wrapped up in her um, identity as an artist. And it's her priority. So yeah, it's just fascinating. It's um, that sounds know, excellent. It's really yeah, it's wow. an amazing book. Yeah, um, and it's only really reflecting on it now that I realise that it it was about relationships, but not the typical ones. So mm. interesting. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question in the chat from Emma. Um, so she says, thanks for such a great discussion. I was wondering what kinds of relationships you are all writing in your next project. So, um, so I'm, my next book is about a relationship between five friends who have a year earlier witnessed a tragic accident. Um, so we meet them on the first anniversary of that accident and look at how the grief has and kind of the trauma of that experience has fractured their lives and their relationships. So um, it's two couples and one friend. And so it's the relationship between the two couples and also with their friendship with the other person and then their relationship with their families and their colleagues and it kind of ripples out from there. So it was quite a complex thing to write, um, to kind of inject grief and trauma into all of those relationships. But I, I did it anyway. <laughs> And then, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I love that. I'm so interested in the relationship between couples and their friends who are single and how that, like over the years, how that... Um... Yeah, I've, I find that's a really interesting thing to, to talk about as I've, I feel like I've been a third wheel quite often in my life. So it's like seeing that experience from the person who feels like they're the third wheel and then from the couple who don't think about them that way and just love having this person around and kind of the dynamic between those three people and how that can change when you throw something like like grief and, tra and trauma into that. Mm. Are the relationships feeling like different to Kokomo to you to write in the second novel? Yeah, very much so. It feels, I mean, they feel like completely different people with different life experiences, despite the fact that I am writing about grief again. My next book after this, that's good, it's going to be a happy book that I've decided no more sad stuff. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> what about um, you? Yeah, so for me, I'm currently um, still working on my my novel Petrichor, um, and that's about a, I guess, a character called Benjamin and his relationships with three women in his life. The first part is uh, told by his wife, Malti. Um, the second part is told by one of their daughters, um, Ellery, and then the third part is told by their second daughter, Verona. Um, and all of these women have completely different relationships with him and completely different perspectives on him. Um, and it's sort of the idea that um, you don't really you don't really know who he is as a character. You're getting this very like filtered, biased information about him through these characters that have particular relationships with him. So it's sort of up to the reader to kind of figure out the the truth of who this person actually is. Um, so, yes, romantic relationships and then two um, father-daughter relationships. So can't wait to see that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, so I've just finished my second or first draft of my new novel and that's, I guess, the main relationship in that novel is between the protagonist and her unborn baby. So she's pregnant through... A lot of the book and then right at the end she gives birth and um it's like the 
first six or so weeks of the baby's life. So it's a lot of around relationship between mother and unborn baby, you know, when it's the, you know, I guess when they doesn't feel like there's any relationship there those kinds of things. And there's also her mother, she has an interesting relationship with her mother and a couple of her close friends. And I'm already thinking about my next book, which is probably going to be about um, a relationship between a older woman and a younger man. Um, and it's also going to be sort of around, I guess, like the idea around people having emotional maybe an emotional, very deep emotional relationship. Um, yeah, so those kinds mm. of Sounds really interesting. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, that doesn't look like we have any other questions in the chat. Uh, at the moment. Oh, we have one more. Let me just see it now. Oh, yep. So, uh, do each of you have, always have a strong sense of what a relationship looks like before you start writing, or do you ever just start writing with two characters and see what happens? Good question. Um, I like to think that I know what's going to happen between two people before I start and often I will have like a little kind of timeline or guide set out but I really enjoy that once you start writing you can sort of be taken by surprise and I think that's my favourite part is that you will start with an idea of what a relationship is going to look like and then it will evolve as the story progresses and end up as something completely different. Yeah, things definitely grow and develop um, in their own way. I agree. Um, I'm definitely a planner in how I approach novel writing. Um, and I'll start yeah, thinking about what I want a relationship to look like. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's definitely um, diverged from that and changed and kind of um, grown into something different through the writing process for me, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'll generally plan, um, I guess, like, Lot, but not so much relationship. But I find that yeah, it just does change sometimes, and maybe even just depending on the day that you're writing and how you're feeling, or something that's happened, and it just suddenly is something different, and that's really cool. So, yeah. Um, okay, well, I think that we'll wrap up soon. We've got two minutes. No, I just wanted to I'd say thank you to the Emerging Writers Festival team who pivoted so grace just gracefully and seemingly easily easily into an online format. I'm sure it wasn't easy behind the scenes, but they've just done such an incredible job. Absolutely. And thanks to you too, Laura, for hosting and um, all the work that, you know, you did with helping us you know, with questions and things. So, yeah, oh. it's been, yeah, it's been great being able to to chat with you, you two this morning, this afternoon. Thank you both so much for helping me and um, lovely to talk to. You. And yes, thank you to the writers, Emerging Writers Festival. Best festival in Australia. Amazing. Such a pleasure to be a part of it and um yeah just to give it to this and just incredible so many great events and there's still lots to come so um thank you both so much and i think um, thank you do we, how do we do this just <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>